Hello, this is Elections Canada. Your polling station has been moved to 94.9 CHRW, your cure for corporate radio. Have a nice day. The views expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of 94.9 CHRW. Whatever horror he witnessed, whatever acts of barbarism, it was done by men. Nothing more. Reavers ain't men. Of course they are. Too long removed from civilization, perhaps. But men. And I believe there's a power greater than men. A power that heals. Reavers might take issue with that philosophy. If they had a philosophy. And they weren't too busy gnawing on your insides. Jane's right. Reavers ain't men. Well, they forgot how to be. And they're just nothing. They got out to the edge of the galaxy, to that place of nothing, and that's what they became. Good morning, London. It's Thursday, March 29, 2012. I'm Bob Metz. And I'm Robert Vaughn. And this is Just Right on CHRW 94.9 FM. Where we'll be with you from now until noon. No, no, not right wing. Just right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fade into color and color into black and white. Under the bedclothes, everything will be alright. Totally have to say I enjoyed that ad coming into the show there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have to put out calls like that. Welcome to the show this morning where 519-661-3600 is the number to call if you want to reach us and perhaps comment on what you've heard on this show over the past couple of weeks. Because today Robert and I are going to share some of our own personal reflections on our, what shall we call it, our recent whirlwind series of interviews and events featuring the Right Honourable Christopher Monckton who was our guest on our last two shows, accompanied, of course, by Professor Christopher Essex on the show two weeks ago. Now, of course, Lord Moncton is a significant player in the field of world politics. He has the credibility of first-hand experience with many of the top leaders in the world, from his days as a personal advisor to Margaret Thatcher, to his lobbying and educating of world government leaders, particularly on the issue of climate change, which was yet another one of his calling cards to fame, to say nothing of his fame and success earned as a developer of Sudoku X. Is that how you say it, Robert? Sudoku, yeah. Yeah. And the Eternity Puzzle Games. So I guess that means we're going to be all over the place today as we recall some of what we've seen, heard, and experienced over that period of time. We'll be talking not just about Lord Moncton, but about some of the issues he's raised and uh, most of which we agree with and a few where we have some differences of opinion, though I have to admit... Maybe some of them are just a matter of semantics. We'll find out as as the show continues. And we have even more original material featuring Lord Moncton on the show today, which we will be hearing throughout the show. Now, uh, Robert, when we started this whole um, adventure a couple of weeks ago, are you you still tired? (laughs) Actually, that was quite a whirlwind, not only for him. I can't imagine how a man like that actually does what he does because it was like nonstop for him. I, I, I knew exactly what he was going through, too, so I was kind of fascinated by just watching him work and watching him do his thing, if you want to put it that way. You know, when we first um, booked Lord Moncton, I sor- sort of did it with the understanding that what we wanted to do was broaden the public's understanding of our guest, not to just see him as this one-dimensional global warming guy, which most people know him from. In fact, on this very show, we've played many clips featuring Lord Moncton on that one issue. So I was kind of welcomed... You know, I rather welcome that challenge to to expand his persona in the public. I think we did all right, and uh, I do. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if everybody out there realizes the uh, videos that we've taken and the interviews we've taken of Lord Moncton. But here's just a, a rundown of some that are already on our YouTube channel mm-hmm. and some that will appear. So we have the video, of course, of his interview at the radio station with Professor Essex. That's up on our website, yeah. justrightmedia.org. Which, by the way, I would say is our very first complete episode of Just Right on YouTube, like complete as the show would appear if you were actually here. It is, yes. And when I watch that, I go, wow, that's like being here. (laughs) (laughs) And it's actually been seen, oh, uh, almost 400 times, I think, in just one week, so that's pretty good. amazing. And um, following that, we had last week's show where I played the audio portion of an interview, a sit-down one-on-one interview 
with Lord Monckton that I made uh, last Tuesday. And Absolutely wonderful. The I, Tuesday I, before this one. That was an amazing interview, Robert. You did a fine job. Well, there. thanks, Bob. Yeah, no, we, we teased out some uh, things about Lord Monckton that not a lot of people know and uh, not a lot of people uh, cared to know about and should know about his mm. education, journalism, background, things of that nature. But that video in its entirety now is up on our website again at justreadmedia.org. And to come in the uh, next uh, week or so is his speech that he gave to the uh, Windermere, at Windermere Manor to supporters of the International Free Press Society who actually helped bring him over here to Western and London. And that's going to be followed up by the, a little video, the audio of which we'll hear today, which is the solution to the sphere and the cylinder uh, puzzle I'm that still, he gave us still two weeks on ago. That one. <laughs> Sorry, same here, yeah. And of course, <coughs> then finally, and the most work for me because I do all the video editing is the Nuremberg Lecture, which is about a two-hour lecture where he talks about some fascinating things from mathematics, architecture, global warming, and a run-in with an IPCC uh, co-author, yeah, which, panel member, which we'll and be hearing later University of Western Ontario professor who, uh, quite rudely if you ask me, interrupted his lecture to mm -hmm. uh, chastise him and then storm out of, <laughs> out of the meeting. But all of that will be online. Yes, and uh, one thing... The first thing I discovered about him, uh, you know, he spent some time with us, even here in the studio. They stayed for a while after the show and, oh, yes, and in, yeah. at the beginning. And you were, uh, you were asking him all these questions, and I realized, man, this guy's a totally open person. You can ask him anything. No strings oh, yeah. attached. Yeah. I was sitting right here when I asked, I'm watching you ask him things that most people would be very uncomfortable talking about. That's why I even uh, asked gossip, him at the beginning. You know? Yeah. All the rumors, all the urban myths. He goes, oh, no, go ahead. He says, oh, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, I was a little cautious about asking him sure. about his Catholicism, about his uh, peerage and the controversy over the, uh, naming him Lord. Mm -hmm. But um, I, so I asked him at the beginning of the interview, do you mind if we talk about this? He said, you ask me any questions you want. That's perfectly fine. And more than that, didn't he look like he was having fun? He did. Yeah, I think he's having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as much as we were. So you were looking into some things about Lord Monckton, and the word Lord is one of those yeah, things. Yeah, just right off the top, you know, everybody you attacks that? the man if you don't like the message, the so-called argument, argument ad hominem, yeah. or attack the man. <laughs> so if you don't like what Lord Monckton is saying, let's attack him. And here's a, the major attack of him is that, oh, he's not really a Lord. Well, yes, he is. He is a Lord in the sense that he's a Viscount, he is the third Viscount of Brenchley, third Viscount Monckton of Brenchley. His grandfather was awarded by letters patent, the Viscount, um, Viscountancy of Brenchley by uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Um, his father inherited that because it is a peerage, it's nobility, and the peerage is handed down by birth, and so he's the third Viscount Monckton of Brenchley. Now, the way that you address a Viscount is Lord. That is the proper way to address a Viscount. As a matter of fact, it's the proper way to address a lot of nobility. And I have a list here, actually. Really? Um, for example... Um, One thing you could say about him is he's a good lord. <laughs> <laughs> good lord, Bob. That was uncalled for. You would call, a, uh, um, uh, for example, a Marquis a lord, a... Um, Marquis? Um, well, I, I've heard it pronounced Marquis, but I don't yeah. know. I'm not British. Um, <laughs> an earl is a lord. Mm. And not only that, the way he would write his name is the right honorable. And that's how earls do it, uh, countesses uh, do it, uh, viscounts do it, and barons. They are the right honorable viscount, mm -hmm. Monkton of Brenchley. So that is quite accurate when he calls himself Lord Monkton. That is the appropriate way to address him. Now, we in Canada, of course, don't really pay much homage to nobility, and uh, I even addressed him as Christopher, and he didn't care one jot that I did that, and I've heard a lot of people address him by his first name, and of course, he doesn't really stand on that kind of uh, peerage uh, more, more know, titles. The, even more to the point on the peerage issue, he also does not go around saying, I'm an expert on anything. In fact, he'll bring bring your attention immediately to the fact that he's not. Yes. And and that what he wants to, the message he's trying to get across to the average person is, we're all experts. We can all learn how to think. In fact, he's planning to write a book on that very subject. How to think. How to think. Yes. And so, he made no claim to authority on any issue other than the evidence he brings with him and presents yes. with him. As a matter of fact, most of the evidence, if not all of it, was presented, for example, on the climate change, by 
the UN documents. He simply looked at them with a critical eye. He stood back, and you need this. He's a policy advisor, a politi- political policy advisor, at least he used to be. <clears throat> so he has this expertise in this mm-hmm. one area of standing back, collating and assimilating a lot of data and coming out with a conclusion. And that's just what he's doing. And if you want to attack what he's saying, that's all well and good. And as a matter of fact, he encourages that. As, as part of the, the process of scientific discovery. Mm-hmm. But don't attack the man. Now, as far as his being a member of the House of Lords, he's contesting that back in 1999 there was a, an act of parliament yeah. which um, said that only certain peers, about 90 of them, I think, hereditary peers, could stay on as the House of Lords. After that, it's all going to be by election. And he's contesting the constitutionality of that. I'll let him fight his own battles on that. Um, but as far as calling him Lord, yep. He's a lord, all right. Absolutely. He's also, I would, I think you called him a man of action. I did, uh, and that's an, I had an interesting anecdote he related oh. to me because after my interview with him, we were just chatting, and of course we talked about his Catholicism. And I wanted to make it plain after the interview that um, I was brought up Catholic. In fact, I was even an altar boy. And I mentioned to him that the priest... No, this wasn't in the interview. This was after. No, yeah. no, it was not in the interview. Uh, I mentioned that the priest whom I was an altar boy for, um, uh, Jim Hickey was his name, Father Jim Hickey. He died in prison for his sins, if you catch my meaning. I wasn't uh, a victim of him, but others were. And Moncton actually related a story. He says, yes, he actually discovered something like that himself. And you know what he did? He called the Holy See. He called the Vatican. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) To rat on this one particular priest. Um, I think he was actually a, a higher than a priest, but um, uh, he called up the Vatican. He didn't wait for anybody else to do it. What do we hear? We hear, why isn't somebody doing something about this? This is a travesty. Right. He doesn't do that. He goes and says, well, what can I do? And he calls up the bloody Pope. Well, not directly, perhaps, but the <laughs> Holy See. He calls right. the Vatican to complain about this. And action was taken. Direct, immediate action was taken on that particular person. So, yeah, he's a man of action. Maybe, maybe that tells you something about the church, too. Maybe some of the problems they have is just people not telling them that things are going on. If that's all it takes. I'm not going to give no. the church one no. bit of leeway on not that. In no. your, <laughs> not, not, not in your own uh, experiences, eh? Nope. Uh, interesting. You, you know, another thing he said he had was a, a classical education. And, yes. he says, and he sort of didn't put it in these words, but he said, it won't get you a job, but it'll teach you how to recognize rot when you hear it. I love that. <laughs> and and I, could, I could relate to that. That's very true. Because once you understand the certain principles of things, even though principles alone won't get you a job, <laughs> but you can understand when something is false or true, even yes. just on, even if it's fresh to you, even if it's new information. My for first you. day at university, my professor um, in mathematics, very first day, he says, "Any of you here, Marie, fresh out of high school? Anyone here thinks that they're going to get a job out of this university education? Go home now and quit. You go to university to get an education. You don't go to university to get a job." And that's stuck, stuck with me these past 25 years. And he's absolutely Still haven't correct. got a job. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I am gainfully employed, yes, no, Bob. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if you were to infer the natural conclusion from that. Yep. But, um, so, uh, are we ready to move on, then, to our next uh, little section? I th- maybe talking about the philosophy of Lord Monk. But before we do, I do oh, want to just... Else. Oh, yeah, you want to talk about thing California. About, yeah, I've That's been right. following what he's been doing in California. He's in California right at the moment. Which is, and he spoke to um, uh, the legislature down there at the uh, invitation of Assemblywoman Shannon Grove. And I've been looking at some of the press he's been getting. And, of course, it's the, the main, mainstream media don't really touch him. They, they didn't touch him here either. Uh, Sun News touched him, of course. Uh, we, Which we to me talked speaks to the value of a station like CHRW and having alternate, yes. alternative radio. That's correct. Because, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at some of the guests we do get on this show that never make it in the... In the you know, they're big guests. They're, they're influential people, people who have changed the world. That's right, and, and controversy scares the big guys. Well, I don't know if it's a controversy or the, sp- the spectrum he's sitting on politically. Now, that could be, too. I think it's you a know, little bit, little bit maybe both. both. But anyway, some of the left-wing press there, this is from the Capitol Weekly. Um, they said he openly uses hate speech when he likens his detractors to fascists and Hitler youth. Um, they, um, they attack the man for, for who pays him because he was brought into California and um, from the Cal- California Coalition of Energy Users. Mm-hmm. Who, who helped bring him to California. So his message is wrong because of the people who are paying him. No. 
Not necessarily. Yeah, it was a different types of people who, who brought him in in different areas. That's right. Yeah, the Wasn't International Free Press Society and the University here. brought him here. Exactly, right. yeah. Now, this is from Think Progress, a um, rather small uh, blog out there, but it says that he's a shameless purveyor of hate speech. Um, he claims that he's a Nobel Prize laureate. No, he's never <laughs> never claimed that. He claims that um, he's cured HIV. No, he's never said that either. So these actually are I think purveyors. we would have noticed, wouldn't we? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> now, these people are actually attacking the man personally because they don't like his message, and the media out there is rife with it. it mm -hmm. It's just... That's all I wanted to say about that. He can fight his own battles, but let's, I just want to let people know out there that a lot of what they hear about him on the uh, Internet or on the news is not accurate. Now, before we go into this next section, you know, I was just thinking, when it comes to science and mathematics and politics, I found Lord Moncton to be utterly devoted to reason and mm -hmm. to reality. That just blew me away. And he hadn't read Ayn Rand. He hadn't heard or he heard of uh, um, John McMurray. Mm -hmm. Um, a philosopher from his own country, so I thought maybe he'd be very familiar with him. And um, yet so many of the conclusions he arrived at there are the same that we would arrive at. Yet one might say that his religious beliefs might trump or contradict his approach to, you know, his philosophy and life on this earth. So we'll take a look at that later on, and uh, we're going to take a break right now. When we return, we'll be returning right after some comments that Lord Monckton made at the, um, that was at the Windermere Manor. Was Windermere it? Manor, yes. here in London, yes. Here in London. We'll return right after this. And our research facilities are the most advanced in Starfleet. Very impressive. You may be even more interested to learn that this man isn't really a biological life form. He's a computer-generated holographic projection. My people believe that physical matter is only an illusion. The body is not the true self. Only a representation. One of our greatest philosophers, Plato, wrote that what we see around us are only poor shadows of ideal objects which exist on a higher plane. That is similar to our teachings. Our connection to what you call a higher plane is more important than our attachment to this brief existence, however real it may seem. We are killing the West in the most direct way possible by killing very large numbers of our children. And this shameful practice is one which is not followed in Islam. They don't do it. They don't believe in it. And in that one overriding respect, and I'll explain why I say overriding in a moment, in that one overriding respect, they are morally superior to us in the West. In many other respects, they are inferior morally. But in that respect, they are morally superior and they know it. And it is that knowledge of an overriding moral superior, superiority that we, don't kill, that we kill our children in the womb and they don't that leads them to exploit this moral difference to the point of increasing their numbers in our countries by as much immigration as they can get away with and as much breeding as they can get away with. And as many of you may yet not be too old to remember, breeding is fun. So they are taking possession of the world as we are throwing away the West. We're throwing away our future because we are throwing away our children and putting the bit into the hospital incinerator. And until we learn to stop doing that, two consequences will follow. One, there's no point in our worrying about the progressive Islamization of our societies because it will happen with ever-increasing rapidity. And two, we had better not think that we're morally superior because we're not. What do you think, Robert? A uh, number of points there. He's very passionate about that particular topic, and of course I think it stems from his Catholicism, though I don't know which came first, his morality or Catholicism. Or, mm -hmm. you know. But I think it's more immoral to have children. 
solely for the purpose of dominating one society to benefit your tribe, which is what he's accusing the Muslims of doing. It's immoral to put the non-existent rights of a potential above that of a woman whose rights should never be in doubt. So I disagree with him, though I empathize with him. I can empathize with people who mm. don't like abortion. As a matter of fact, I no, don't no, like abortion. Now, let's be clear. He didn't say anything about laws on abortion. That he didn't did come up at all, so we're not even on that page. No, we're talking about morality right. here. Mm -hmm. Is it moral to abort a fetus? I certainly think it's, um, He's first of all, the choice of the woman, but I think it's a rather sad practice. I, I'm, I'm not certain that he would disagree with the right, but we don't know. We, did, we mm -hmm. didn't get a chance to talk to him about that. But I noticed in his, in his talk that his concern was the degree to, to which this was happening comparatively yeah. in two cultures. And, you know, my, my immediate response is, well, there is no such thing as a collective moral superiority. You can say... Exactly, Bob. You can say, we, and we do use the term cultural superiority because that refers to the collective but it refers to that greater sense of life that a culture may have or not mm. have and uh, but not moral superiority because something's either right or wrong that's the moral axiom right there each action and not every abortion may be wrong you know even on an individual basis so right is always right or if you will morally superior in that way i guess but you can't say that something, that each action is immoral just because of its collective possible um, consequence to a society. And uh, now, of course, he said nothing about talking about um, the law or whether he agreed with whether we should have it made illegal or anything like that. So that never came up. <clears throat> but um, it was interesting, his whole, his whole stand on, on Islam, and he said that was the only issue. It seemed like a more of a demographic um, tactical um, statement that he was making about it, do you think? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I think it's domination by the womb, I think he called it. And, and there we've, are, we've referred to that ourselves. Yeah, there are Muslims out there um, of that bent who think that they should uh, overrun a population by massive immigration and by massive birth, mm -hmm. by uh, uh, breeding their opposition to a minority position. And to that extent, to have a child solely for the purpose of making sure that there's more of them than us, that's totally immoral. No, I agree. That's reprehensible. That is so sad, actually, for the child to think that that's the sole purpose that, um, that they would have a child. Well, the thing is, you see that in so many totalitarian countries, which, which surprised me that he would say that if, you know, as, as someone who studies history. Um, <laughs> I know that, and it's always horrible to mention this name, Hitler, <laughs> but in Nazi Germany, abortion was illegal because they wanted to send 16-year-olds to the front, you know? And so, do you kill your children in the womb or do you kill your children outside the womb? What, what, what about issues like China, where, you know, where the state does control and you have a one-child policy and they don't care whether it's inside the womb or outside the womb? That's right. And so, you don't want to get the state involved in any case, which... Again, is a separate issue. Now, you know, I, I often wonder how literal he takes his his religious beliefs. They weren't part of that particular uh, talk. Did, did, did we want to talk about that later in the show, or, or? Well, why don't we jump on it right now? Because um, okay. I found it fascinating that he could marry the um, teachings of Catholicism with reason, with logic. Well, I have a quote from. Um, and he from, does it quite well. I, I have a quote from uh, your interview with him. Hmm. And to me, this placed a lot of things in perspective and sort of muddied the water in a way, too, in terms of what he might mean. He might be re you know, referring to a lot of symbolism here. And he said, quote, If we lose the use of reason, we lose that central power of the soul, which differentiates us from the rest of creation and chiefly gives us our likeness to the Creator. We must not lose our very humanity, which is best marked out by the fact that we can exercise the faculty of reason. If we throw that away, we're not just throwing out the baby with the bathwater, we're throwing out the whole of humanity at the same time. Now, that's a sentiment I can totally... 100% agree with, with yeah. And it sounds very much like John McMurray, which is why I wanted you to ask him if he had heard of John McMurray, because he, he thinks so much like him. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of that um, religious um, symbolism in all of the issues that we deal with. 
And so I just wondered if you ran into any of uh, those things in your interview after the <laughs> after your interview or anything like that. No, we didn't get into that anymore. I thought that he expressed it very well during the interview that uh, he looks at Catholicism in a completely different way than I did when I was being brought up, of course. It's being forced down your throat as, as a child. So one of the reasons I rejected it was because of that uh, imposition. What are you saying? He didn't... He, he looks at it from a perspective, like, for example, you would agree with that sentence completely, as would I. Mm -hmm. But I would never use the term uh, soul. I would never I, use I the might. term God. Mm. You know, those, those words, I, I, I find different words for them. You know. Yes, because they are words that can be misinterpreted so often. Right? Yes. And that's the danger of using them. But when someone predefines it right there in front of you... Mm -hmm. Does it bother you as much? Nope. No, there you nope. go. That's, what, that's the point I'm making. Nope. Didn't bother me at all. And, and, uh, you Not know, that it bothers me if it comes from anybody else anyway. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Another thing I found fascinating by uh, that, that he was saying was about his, um, his aristocratic background, he said, and he was born with se several silver spoons <laughs> in his mouth, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Which he acknowledges quite openly. But yet he talks he about, can't deny it. No, and yet he talks about... But he understands, I think, to acknowledge it is to take it into consideration when you're dealing with other people and with how you express your ideas. And, I, you know, the, this man's a gentleman through and through. There's no two ways about that. And um, you, you did bring up that when he worked at the Yorkshire Post and he got the attention of Margaret Thatcher and the Conservatives, that that was, uh, you know, how did he put it? It's my natural ability. <laughs> my natural genius and, and ability. ability. He and, then, and he added very quickly, <laughs> and luck. And luck. <laughs> because, of course, they, he was attracted, uh, or the Conservative Party was attracted to his writings, which were anonymous mm -hmm. as part of the editorial staff on the Yorkshire Post. So they didn't even know who he was. And if you talk about his silver spoons, I think that they've probably done him worse than they have done him favor. Because... Just look mm. at the uh, the writings in the on the internet and and the media today. They're all attacking the man again well, because of his our aristocratic background. Ooh, he can't be right. Oh, he's such a, a upper class twit or a snob. You know, I mean, why should we listen to him? He's part of the uh, the upper crust. He's so privileged. Well, those those silver spoons are probably uh, an anchor to a lot of uh, what he to getting his ideas out there. Well, sure. And the other thing, he overcame his environment. He just didn't absorb it. He, he said that he was uh, taught in a school that was extremely left-wing, didn't he? Yes, Churchill College, which yeah. is a brand new school, by the way, at, uh, in Cambridge in 1960. Uh, very left-wing, I guess, and uh, also in Cardiff. But uh, Harrow School, I wouldn't call left-wing. <laughs> that was his, uh, basically his <laughs> high school, his middle, middle high school. Now, you got into a conversation with him as well on the issue of uh, where journalism was heading. That was, that was fascinating. Yes, you take away from that particular discussion what we all know to be true, and that is there's no such thing out there anymore as a true news reporter. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to be filtered through either the left or the right. There's a filter out there of a political spectrum, of a, an ideology, and there's a lot of editorializing going on. We just heard that the other day when the budget came down here sure. in Ontario. In the news reporting, not not the in, news reporting. Yeah. Yes, it looks like a bloodbath. <laughs> All those words, editorializing, yeah, yeah, like bloodbath was in the budget. Oh yes, uh -huh. the bloodbath budget. Oh, this budget's going to hurt a lot of people. <laughs> well, that's editorializing. Yeah, that's right. What he said was to report the news is simply to answer uh, answer the question, what happened next? Yes, what a, what a great focus to keep in your mind too to segregate how to write when you're doing a news report versus mm -hmm. from your opinions on that news. Gee, Robert, we're at the bottom of the hour. I think it's time to take a break. I, what, what are we hearing here now? This We're going to be hearing something from the Nuremberg Lecture. Is that correct? Going into this break? Right, yes. The 15th Annual Nuremberg Lecture held here at UWO, the Applied Mathematics Department, and it was uh, hosted by Professor Christopher Essex. Mm -hmm. And he gave a fascinating talk. And what we're going to hear here is a an outtake. Not an outtake, I shouldn't say that. It you, was an you interruption. You always, you always criticize me for using that word. Yeah, I just, I just corrected myself, Bob. <laughs> it's an interruption yeah. in his lecture when he was in the question and answer period. He was answering a question, and Professor Gordon McBean, who may be known to many Londoners, uh, he has a, a professorship in, uh, what is it, geography and uh, political science, you know, well, I know he's uh, been on... Oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a very educated man, Professor Gordon McBean, B.Sc. in Physics, Ph.D. in Oceanography, M.Sc. in Meteorology. Um, he probably knows a lot of what he's talking about. However, 
the clip we're about to hear indicates that um, he's just as guilty of these attacks against the man rather than the argument. Mm. And we'll be back right after this. These points are in the literature. There were references on most of those slides. The data, for instance, are the published data. They're not my graphs. They're the graphs published by the IPCC in 1990. Now, I grant you, the IPCC is not peer-reviewed. I'm sorry about that. It should be, in my view. The models it uses are not peer-reviewed. Nine-tenths of its case is based on those models, which are not peer-reviewed. Nearly a third of all the references it gives to the so-called scientific literature are to literature which is not scientific at all. It's not peer-reviewed. It's children writing student essays. It's activists shambling around the world making stuff up. It's greeny organisations. Now these, I, I'm sorry, I'm answering the gentleman's question. These, these, these organisations are producing reports that are not peer-reviewed, but are being quoted by the IPCC. The IPCC no, has that's reviewed right. more than any paper you have ever no, seen. I don't think that's right. Uh, can you silence? Please be effective at silence. He's leaving. He's leaving, that's all right, good. Um, you could have asked a question if you'd stayed. Okay. But no, you're okay. not to interrupt. I'm answering this gentleman's no. question. Be silent until I've finished. Hmm. Now, um, the point is this, sir, that the IPCC's work is not peer-reviewed in any sense recognised to science. If you send a paper to a journal for peer review, it is sent out to reviewers whom the editors find to be expert in that field. They then write their reviews. If the author then fails to make changes, then the paper does not get published. Now, the IPCC's authors, if they write, and then the reviewers say, oh, no, no, we don't think this is right. We don't think, let us say, that the Himalayan glaciers are going to disappear in only 25 years. Then the IPCC's authors say, we don't care. We want to influence governments. That was, in effect, what Mr Lau, who was the co coordinating lead author of that chapter in the 2007 report, said. He said, we wanted to influence governments, so we weren't going to change it. We knew the figure was wrong. So they're putting in figures they know to be wrong, even when the reviewers tell them not to. You can't do that in a properly peer-reviewed document. And it's a fundamental defect in the whole way the IPCC happens. And of course, all the reviewers can look at the drafts, but as I have shown you and given you plain evidence in front of your own eyes, here their principal conclusions on two of the four occasions I showed you were altered after the final reports of the IPCC scientists had been submitted to the IPCC. And if you ask the IPCC about this, they say, oh, but we sent them to a contact group. And you ask who was on the contact group? Representatives of governments, most of whom have no scientific qualifications whatsoever. So if anyone asked me, should I take the documents of the IPCC seriously, I will merely show the evidence I've shown you here. And if I had shown that to my Prime Minister, she would have withdrawn all funding from the IPCC and would have seen to it that the whole organisation was abolished before it could do any more damage. It is not a scientific organisation. It was set up as a political organisation explicitly by uh, Sir Maurice Strong 25 years ago. He said that that was what he was doing. He did not intend it to be scientific. It wasn't and isn't and never will be scientific. And as soon as it is swept away, the happier I shall be. I think Gordon, you should get a chance to have a few moments to comment and then ask a question, please. Thank you. I'd like to ask if you've ever asked the distinguished UK scientist, for example, Sir John Houghton. Uh, yeah. Yeah, speak up, please. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're not here. We're not here. Sir John Houghton is an eminent British scientist, fellow of the Royal Society, professor at Oxford, as I recall. 
who told me in my days when I was working with him that he many times went to Chequers and spent the weekends with Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister after you left. Can you tell me if you've ever spoken to Sir John Houghton and you telling me, are you going to tell this audience that he was a liar? What I'm going to tell this audience is that he was wrong. As I said, there are many reasons why the experts are wrong some of the time. I'm not saying experts are always wrong. But just because they've got fancy names and titles, that doesn't guarantee that they are right. And it was 2,300 years ago, sir, that the philosopher Aristotle first codified the fallacies of human logic, not the least of which the best move you made. was the argumentum ad vericundiam, the argument from false appeal to authority. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody says in science, however eminent they are, if what they say is contradicted by the evidence. The evidence shows... Welcome back to Just Right on CHRW Radio. 94.9 FM, where, and you can find us on the internet as well as um, CHRW Radio at chwradio.com. You can find us at justrightmedia.org, where you'll find videos and audios of all our past shows. Well, not uh, videos of all our past shows, but no, that was some a, shows. That was just dangling yeah. out there, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you can find video, and you can also find audio of all our past shows. There you go. Except for that one we lost, remember? Yes, we did lose <laughs> one show. Oh, you can find 241 of them yeah. out there. If you found it in the gutter somewhere, please please pick it up and right. return it. Let's move on. <laughs> anyway, that was Lord Moncton, of course, at the Nuremberg Lecture. Now, I disagree with Moncton when he says that the IPCC work has not been peer-reviewed. Lord Moncton, being a member of the British nobility, is a peer of the realm. And he's done just that. <laughs> it oh, okay. is peer-reviewed. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. it was peer-reviewed. All right, a little straight. Okay, now the it, kind no, of... It, while you're on the subject, you mm. know, I, I thought it was, wasn't surprising that Gordon McBean rudely exited the event as soon as Lord Moncton brought up the name Aristotle. As soon as he said... Yeah. Aristotle, yeah. he turned on his heels yeah. and walked out. I've got it all on you know, video. And, and, I mean, that's like flashing a crucifix in front of a vampire. <laughs> I mean, the man is obviously not philosophically oriented, right? No. And I don't know how you can be in science no. without being philosophically oriented. You know, right. McBean couldn't distinguish between the honest disagreement with the work of John Houghton and that of calling him a liar. This is obviously another ad hominem attack on Moncton, perhaps even baiting him to call Houghton a liar. It's intellectually dishonest for McBean to have done that. I would have thought he would have brought up some kind of scientific evidence to refute Lord Moncton. Yes. Not saying, oh, did you hang out with Margaret Thatcher after you left? Well, no, he didn't hang out with her after he left. What was that all about? I couldn't even figure out where he was going with that. Uh, you know, well, carry, you know, carry on. I know you... you know, this kind of general analysis by a competent policy analyst such as Moncton is its what missing from the climate change argument, and I really enjoyed his lecture. The individual scientists of the IPCC, um, and McBean was one of them, they have either too narrow a scope or they're too influenced by personal gain to see the, the machinations and the wealth redistribution agenda of UN politicians. Mm. And I think that came out in, in his lecture, and I was really glad that we attended that. And you were there as well, Bob, with about um, 80 people, I think I counted there. Well, I, I counted around 90 or so, yep. once or twice. And, uh, you know, and it, remember, this wasn't a big open public event. It was a mathematics department yes. kind of a deal, right? <laughs> and um, I was sitting at the far back of the lecture hall and happened to witness the whole exchange from there, even before I knew who the rude person interrupting was. Actually interrupting, I couldn't believe it, because it's a civilized discussion going on. You'll hear one person in the background, right. when he walked out, he says, that's the best move you've made today, yeah. sir. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, it was my first time I saw Mr. McBean for the first time. And when you confirmed it was him after your interview with Lord Moncton, um, it, it brought back a bad memory because, I, I, you know, he once appeared on an open line show right after I had very succinctly and clearly outlined a case against man-made global warming, only to tell the show host Sean Array at the time, uh, you know, that people 
who denied man's role in climate change were just idiots. That's what he told her <laughs> right after I was on. And she was, you could, you could hear her disappointment and shock at the well, lack of content that she received yeah. when she asked him about a litany of specific concerns. And I'm thinking, well, okay, maybe a bad moment, maybe this, but that's how I've seen this man behave each and every time name calling. I've seen him in public. He's calling people he names. Calls oh, you're an dis- idiot. Oh, yeah. Or just dismisses the argument without even addressing a single fact. And I'm going, how does a guy like that get into anything he shouldn't be shouldn't be in public anyway not 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 having public debates but um anyways that's all i have to say about him you had some other comments you wanted to mention or about ukip and because our time is flying yeah, yeah just just finally now just to get off the nuremberg mm-hmm. lecture for a bit there and to return to uh, a, an interview i did oh, about a month and a half ago now mm-hmm. of paul weston yes on um who split off from ukip he, he split off from UKIP because UKIP, in his words, were not uh, being harsh enough on the is- Islamification of, of Britain. And yet when I read the UKIP policies on Britain, I find that they are quite uh, more restrictive than, than Britain has at the moment, and they're quite reasonable. And listening to what Lord Moncton had to say, now Lord Moncton is actually head of the policy group for UKIP. He was actually a deputy leader back in 2010. So I'm thinking that uh, maybe Mr. Weston should rethink joining mm-hmm. the uh, British Freedom Party because, first of all, it's not a freedom party. It is more of a conservative party. It's more of a single issue to him and that party that they deal with the Islamification. So um, as far as the United Kingdom Independence Party goes, I think that they're probably the way that the Brits should go. They have members in the uh, uh, European Parliament. They do fairly well in the polls in Britain. And, and doing better and better all the time. And with a man like Mr. Moncton or Lord Moncton at the uh, helm of their policy uh, group, I think that they can um, only do right in, for Britons. I found his, in, in the very concluding portion of our second interview that you did with him on your own there, you ended up on the subject of the problem of Islamism. And uh, he took this approach that we should love our enemy kind of approach. Mm. And uh, under the I guess, philosophy or idea that um, by, quote, loving them, and I know what he means by that. Again, this is what makes me think of John McMurray. You know, you accept people for what they are until they give you a reason to think otherwise. But he was suggesting that we would have the the opportunity to change them and them not change us. However, I don't know that I can completely agree with that in light of some of the other things he was saying. And, and, and he's talking about all this love in, in, the, in the context of some of those policies you were saying. Well, no, there, we, we wouldn't have any Sharia law. And he had a whole bunch of other, you know, we would restrict immigration. We would have all these other rules. And I'm thinking, well, that sounds like a loving approach of some sort. But, you know, I'm always reminded by Aya and Hersi Ali, who always stressed repeatedly that one of the reasons we in the West have not understood the motivations of the Islamists is that they do not live for this world, Mm -hmm. which kind of feeds into the whole religious thing. For them, this life is not their destination. They prepare for an afterlife, right? All during, you know, the religious part of their actual life. That's what it's all about. And let's face it, afterlife is just a euphemism for what most of us call death. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, and, and then, of course, there's a whole philosophy is of, of Islam, is, is, as it self-states, one of submission, one of obedience. And these are very fundamental concepts, totally alien to the concepts of free will, reason, and memory, the three Christian tenets of which Lord Moncton spoke. So there were all these contradictions going on on the religious element, but somehow he's able to keep that separate from his pursuit of the truth in science, in politics, in, in basically the real world, if you want to put it that way. I agree, yes. And um, so, so that's, that was just an interesting contrast. I'm going to take a break now, and when we return, we're going to hear Lord Moncton really confuse us <laughs> oh, dear. As, he try, as, he, well, as he explains that puzzle that uh, he left with us to solve a couple of weeks ago. We'll return right after this. What the world really needs right now, in these trying times, is for aliens to invade. Because then everyone, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, will all put aside our differences and join forces. With the aliens against the Arabs.
So, Lord Moncton, you asked us a question on the radio show the other day about a sphere and a cylinder. You want to repeat the question and perhaps give, finally give us an answer to that conundrum? All right, it was a little tease. The question was, a cylindrical hole exactly one metre long is drilled right through the centre of a sphere. What is the volume remaining in the sphere? Now, the answer to the question can be approached in two ways, as I explained uh, on the programme. First, by logic, which is the quickest way, and second, by mathematics, mm -hmm. to confirm the logic. Now, I won't do the mathematics for you today because it's a little bit long, but I can do the logic for you. The interesting thing about the question is the information that you are not given. You're not told what is the diameter of the sphere. You're not told what is the diameter of the cylindrical hole. Correct. All you're told is the cylindrical hole passes right through from one side to the other. And that it's a and metre long. Meter of long. the sphere. Mm -hmm. And that it has a length of, a meter. of one metre. Mm -hmm. So, the next thing that one would do, having identified that the information hasn't been given, is to understand that provided that the questioner is acting in good faith, the information hasn't been given because it isn't necessary. If it isn't necessary, you then have to look at what are the limiting cases. Now, clearly, there's no upper limit to the size of the sphere or of the hole. As the sphere gets bigger, obviously, the, the hole will get bigger too um, because you've got to keep it only at one metre right. in height. So in the end, you end up with a cylindrical disc, rather like a coin, if you like, uh, going right out with a tiny, tiny strip of, let us say, planet Earth around the edge of it, and all the rest would have been carved out through the, with the two spherical caps plus the cylindrical depth of one metre and the other sort of spherical cap at the bottom, mm -hmm. leaving just a very thin wafer of Earth. So, then you go to the other or lower limiting case. And the lower limiting case, obviously, is that is, since the hole is one metre long, then the sphere through which it is being drilled cannot be less than one metre in diameter, that kind of follows, Correct. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, since you're told uh, what you are told, that it is a one metre hole, you can legitimately infer that the answer to the question is that the volume remaining in the sphere, however big the sphere, and however small it is, as long as it's not smaller than one, one metre, is of course equivalent to the volume of a sphere, one metre in diameter. And that's all you need to know to get the answer. That's the value of being able to use logic as well as mathematics. Logic gets you there often in a much quicker way than sometimes mathematics can. And then what you can then do is use mathematics to study the area of the, <coughs> the volume of the spherical caps, the volume of the cylinder, the volume of the sphere. You can do sums, you can check it for spheres of different sizes, you can eventually apply the necessary calculus to establish that this will always be the case and check that the answer is right. But the answer you can get, as I did when I was first asked that question, simply by logic. It seems to me that that kind of a question can differentiate between the actions of a computer and the actions of a human mind. That's the point. One of the things mm. that a human can do is find shortcuts that the computer may not have been programmed to understand. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, there are limits to the intelligence of a machine but there are no limits to the intelligence of a human properly and diligently and artfully applied. Well, I don't know what that says about Bob you know, and I, but we didn't come up with the correct answer. Well, I, we came up with two different answers that were very close. I thought um, my, my answer was I just assumed the sphere was a meter in size, period. And I said, well, if you put a, a cylinder in it, it's still going to be the same volume. <laughs> That but you my, hadn't quite I, thought it through. To not, the, not to the I never thought yeah. because I thought you were placing that limitation on it. Didn't no, no, no. I thought no. You there said was no, the, no, the, the, no statement about the diameter right. of the sphere. No, at see, all. I assumed <laughs> it went through from one side to the other. Now Robert came up with another idea that I thought also made sense. Too. I was thinking of the relationship and yes. that. Um, first of all, if you're going to ask such a question, there must be an answer for it for all cases. Yes. Correct. Because you did not give us the dimensions, right. the width of the cylinder, nor the diameter of the sphere. Mm. So I, I, I got the idea that it had mm. to be, of course, an all-case type of scenario. So and between it, you, you had the right answer, well, which makes so. you a good team. <laughs> <laughs> Two heads are as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord Longton. Thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you.
not too sure if two heads are better than one. <laughs> you know, I realized with that puzzle, it depended how you visualized the sphere and the cylinder. Because when I heard him describe it, it wasn't quite the way I saw it in my mind. And I think he may have misspoke in the question, because I'm sure I heard him say that the cylinder goes from one side to the other of the sphere. Right? So if it goes from one side to the other, and it's a meter long, doesn't the sphere have to be a meter? <sighs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> I've got another puzzle. Oh, never mind. I won't even go there. I thought maybe we'd just close off in the last few minutes with some very personal impressions and observations of Lord Moncton. Um, you know, just, just watching him, watching him work, even at the Nuremberg lecture when he first came into the room. Uh, he, he came into the room early before, you know, as people were still coming in and sitting in the audience. And he went around the whole room and, and you know, shook hands with people and made himself available. And I remember uh, Tim Hodges sitting beside me, the London West uh, Freedom Party candidate. He says, now there is a lost art, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. And I was thinking, yeah, no kidding. And, of course, Moncton, when you asked him about his favorite philosopher, who did he say? Aristotle. Aristotle. And, of course, Aristotle is the right. Plato is the left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what makes him just right, isn't it? And uh, amazingly, he was unfamiliar with the work of Ayn Rand and John McMurray, and yet both of them are Aristotelian, and that's per perhaps why they arrive at such similar conclusions. Well, he's not, he's not unfamiliar with it in the sense that he, he said Well, he hadn't that, read them. He, was, that's what he I said mean. he couldn't speak intelligently right. about uh, objectivism. However, of course, he knew of, of her work, and he was uh, pleasant surprised at the uh, penetration into the minds of West, particularly the youth, mm -hmm. uh, that objectivism has has made. So uh, I think yeah, that... Young folks like us. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking at the yeah, time. Maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. But um, again, I think he might be surprised to learn that much of what he was saying he might enjoy reading in McMurray and Rand. I remember he, uh, he said he was reading Bertrand Russell and basically concluded that anyone who needs 150 pages to conclude that A is A has just wasted 149 pages. <laughs> he didn't put it that way, but that was the... Yeah, he said he found him tedious or tedious. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I would too. I mean, A is A is a postulate mm -hmm. of mathematics, is, is an axiom. So Now he's writing a book. He's, yes. he's planning to call it How to Think. How to Think, yeah. Uh, we've been calling that, that epistemology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's what we do on this show. It's a, and it's all about language, mathematics, and logic, and things maybe that, like maybe that. Maybe that's why we don't get a lot of fan mail. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe you know, if, if, if I were to uh, recommend a couple of books I might think he would like, they would be, believe it or not, Ayn Rand's Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. That would be the one I'd pick for him. Because I think that would appeal to his logical and mathematical mm -hmm. way of thinking to his interest in language, to his interest in math, as he says, the pathways of thought. And uh, that's what that book's about. And it's, and it's the thinnest book. <laughs> so, so it's the least challenging in terms of you won't have to waste 150 pages <laughs> getting to the answer on that one. Now, if anything can be, Ryan can be uh, accused of, it is not um, verbiage. That's right. I might also recommend for him something like John McMurray's Reason and Emotion and Isabel Patterson's God of the Machine. Mm -hmm. A lot of his ideas are very similar to theirs. And they, they skip, think... Skip the first three chapters of God of the Machine. Anybody who picks up that book, just skip the first three chapters. Well, that's because they're more history. I think he'd like yeah. that too. But they yeah. are about um, science, mathematics, mm -hmm. energy, things like that. And... Um, Moncton obviously doesn't need any lessons in appreciating the virtues of capitalism or being a capitalist, which is refreshing and enlightening in this day and age because uh, when you mentioned, uh, oh, you're a real capitalist to him after he was talking about his games that he puts on the market, he, he didn't hold back on he that one. He said unashamedly so. Yes, yes, it was really refreshing to see. So, um, any other comments? Robert? Well, I, I was just smitten by his... Um, his mannerism, his speaking ability, and I think it all came from his, uh, not necessarily his aristocratic background, though it certainly did get him into the best schools in Britain. Um, Harrow is one of the best private schools in the world, and um, where he talked about the ground, the foundation for his education, and I think that if all of us had such a foundation, we could be um, just as critical in a positive sense, as, as he is of climate change, we could be just as critical of anything else. And the three things that he was taught, he said, grammar, 
was basically beaten into him. <laughs> I like that. Mm -hmm. And then he was taught logic. And that's probably where his love for uh, Aristotle comes from. And then lastly, rhetoric, mm -hmm. which is, of course, a dying art because rhetoric is the art of expression. Yes. It's the art of making an argument, putting forward your ideas. And making it interesting so that it'll be compelling. That's exactly. the essence. And all this is from his high school mm -hmm. in Harrow. I, I don't imagine that he got a lot of this from, uh, uh, from Cambridge University. Univers uh, right. Where to go? Churchill College, yes. Well, I won't pretend that we have in any way solved the puzzle that is Lord Monckton. But I can conclude this. I would say he is the right, he is the honorable Lord Christopher Monckton. That's Agreed. all I can say. And that's it for this week as we leave you for another week. Join us again next week when we continue our journey in the right direction. Until then, be right, stay right, do right, act right, think right. We'll be right back here. We'll see you then. Fade into color, color into black and white. Under the bed clothes, everything will be... <laughs> um, when I was a kid, my dad was really paranoid about safety. Like he always made me wear a parachute. <laughs> Not even just on an airplane, but when I'd go to school or hang out with my friends. And it was really embarrassing. And I was like, Dad, this really isn't fair. No one else has to do this. And he'd say, if all the other kids jumped off a cliff, would you? And I was like, well, I'm wearing a parachute. <laughs> so I'd probably be okay. <laughs> Thank you.